morning, everybody. How are you? How's everybody doing? Good? Good. Um, I was wondering if I could just take a quick poll to kind of get a sense of who's here today. Can I just have a show of hands of people who um, are therapists? How many people in the room are occupational, speech, or physical therapy? Oh, a large number of you guys. Great. How about nursing? We have a lot. Of, oh, we have an equal number of nursing. And how about um, folks maybe in administration or, and let's face it, some of you are doing this, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Well, welcome. And, you know, hopefully we're live with the web streaming soon. And um, we'll try to do our best to keep you engaged this morning and introduce some, some new items and some exciting times for us in IRFs. So let's hope the slide advancer is working. So my task for the next 15 minutes or so is to sort of do a quick introduction to the IRFPI, the version 1.4. And by now, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with um, the tool and what it looks like. You happen to have one in your packets, and so as the speakers are speaking today, it might be helpful to kind of pull it out and follow along so that you can um, see where the coding is and, and how that all works. So let's, let's talk a little bit about implementation for October 1. So beginning October 1st, we're going to need to provide um, information on the new items. We're going to be transmitting those items on October 1st. So when we submit our items on October 1st, those are based on our discharges. So it's important for us to remember that if we're discharging people in October, that those are our patients in September, right? So we're going to need to be doing our assessments and collecting our information so that we can complete the IRFPI 4 transmission on October 1. And each of you knows what types of patients that you have in your facility, so you kind of have a sense of what your lengths of stay are and what lead time you may need in your facility. For us, in the facility where I work, uh, we have decided to begin to collect the item information now. We did some of our training the last couple of weeks, and we are collecting our information now. When my colleague and I go back, we're going to sort of look at things and see where we stand and see if we need to do some more training or some, some tweaking um, so that we're, we're really feeling confident by October 1st. So it's important to remember you do need to have that information for those patients being discharged. Additionally, completion of the IRFPI and the new, the new items are for those Medicare Part A patients, uh, what I always call um, traditional Medicare, uh, for your Medicare Part C patients, you know, your managed Medicare, and then for any Medicare secondary, um, if you're anticipating that you're going to get some payment from Medicare on those. So it's required for those patients. Uh, again, at the facility where I work, we've decided to collect the information on all our patients. We think it's great information. It's great data. Um, you know, I, I'm a nurse, and I work in quality, so we love data. We love data. Um, and it's, it's kind of a joke around the facility because I always, I'll say things at a meeting and say, oh, we never, whatever. And uh, then I go back to the data and I say, you know, we actually do sometimes. And so data can be really helpful and uh, I encourage you to use it whenever you can. One of the first things that I would recommend you doing if you haven't already is really determine which of your clinicians are going to be responsible for which um, items. So again, as an example, what we did was we met a while ago and went item by item each of the new items, and we identified which clinicians would be assessing that information or have primary responsibility for assessing that information. And for us, that was really helpful because it, it allowed us to set up a plan that required training for less people rather than training everyone on everything we were able to do our training and our education for those folks who really needed each piece of information. And we found that that felt a lot uh, easier to do and was uh, well received by the uh, clinicians. You know, if you haven't already started your training, you know, it's a good time to start now and, and um, it's not too late. Uh, you can certainly go back after the training the next couple of days 
and start implementing some training. And there's a lot of great, fun ways to do it. You guys, I'm sure you, um, you have folks at your facility that um, you have you know, different ways that people learn. Uh, we've played Jeopardy during lunch. We've had a fishbowl where we have, you know, those little candy Smarties, and we attach a question to the Smarties, so when they take a, a candy out of the uh, fishbowl, they have to answer the question, but they get the little candy. Um, little different things that can kind of engage people and make it a little more fun for them. Um, and again, if, if you haven't already started collecting information, it's a good time to go ahead and start. It uh, gives you some opportunity to sort of regroup and, and start, start over um, or make some adjustments as you need to do. Now, some of the key differences, I think this is an important piece to kind of keep in mind over the next day and a half, is that there are some key differences to the items that we'll now be assessing in comparison to the ones that we currently assess. And that is you're going to want to make sure that you understand what it is that you're collecting and that you know what those data collection instructions are. They are different. And so for your training, you're going to want to make sure you know the differences. Uh, the rating scales used for the new measures are different than the ones we currently um, assess. So it's important that people understand the differences so that they're not um, confused. Um, and you want to know what the item definition is. Um, they're all clearly defined in the training manual. And um, it's a great idea to have some training manuals out on your units um, and have them around for staff to refer. And one of the things we always say at our facility is, when in doubt, you talk it out. So if you have a question about something, you want to make sure that you run it by someone else or just kind of talk the scenario out with a colleague. And we find that it really helps with learning and, and um, consistency for, for staff. One of the things that you'll also hear us talk about over the next couple of days is we're going to refer to coding these items. So when I first heard about coding, um, we, we got involved in the project you know, nine, 10 months ago. And when they first started talking about coding, for me, the term coding, I thought of like the medical coder, you know, those people that go through your records and, and look through the H&P and kind of assign ICD-10 codes, you know what I mean? Coders. Well, for here, for the purposes of these new items, you're going to be coding these items. That's the term that we use. So we currently have other items that we score. And now we're going to have new items that we code. So one of the things that was helpful for us was we, we talk that language when we're in the facility. So if, if an employee comes up to me or a clinician comes up to me and says, you know, Karen, I have a question about bladder, my first response back to them, is this a coding question or is this a scoring question? So that that way I'm sure I'm, we're talking the same language, we're talking the same uh, data definition, we're talking the same assessment um, instructions and the same rating scale. So over the course of the next day and a half, we're going to be talking about coding these items. Um, one of the things that we do at our facility, again, is uh, every morning, we still do breakfast trays. Do you guys do breakfast trays in your facilities? Patients get their breakfast on a tray. So each of, each of every day, um, the patients are brought their breakfast, and there's a tented card, an inspirational card, to help them start their day on a positive note. And this was one that was um, on their trays um, a couple of months ago, and we thought it was an important thing moving forward because it's important for all of us to embrace the changes that we're facing over the next years in healthcare. Um, and there are people who embrace change better than others in our facilities. We all know who they are and uh, how people respond. But I think there are some things that we can do to help folks to make changes easier. And I think we need to sort of set the environment for some success. So if you want to create an environment that is a successful environment, I think there are some key things that we can do um, in order to be able to do that. And the first thing is, you know, set the example. And what I always say is, you know, things are received better when they're presented in a positive note. So I think, you know, we've presented this as a great opportunity to improve uh, post-acute care transitions. And if you look at what the IMPACT Act, the an acronym IMPACT, 
That's, that's what it is. It's improving Medicare post-acute care transitions. And I don't think anybody in this room isn't um, excited about the opportunity to improve transitions from the hospitals to us, from us to, to home care or to nursing homes. And so it's important to, to set forward what it is that we're attempting to do. Break up the project into smaller pieces. Again, I mentioned we uh, went item by item and went through and assigned a clinician for uh, each item set. What we actually did was we got a group of people in a room, the head of therapy, our nursing directors, myself, and we brought in our IT person. And what we did was we went item by item and we identified who's gonna be doing that. And then where would, does it make sense for them to document things? Um, so that we then used our electronic medical record to help us collect the information that we are assessing so that we could retrieve it from our medical record easier. And we created what we're calling sort of an ERF report, and that will pull in items that we know we are assessing. And it will allow the person who will be doing our coding to look at that report and identify where she may need to query individuals, uh, where she may need to get some clarification, but it's, a, it's an easier way to retrieve the information. So get a group of people together and identify how you can work together to get the project done. We also were surprised at how much people wanted to help. Uh, we brought in our pre-admission folks. Um, as Mark had mentioned, part of our department is admission, case management, and quality. So we pulled our pre-admission folks in and said, so based on our assessments, you guys spend a lot of time in the hospital and talking with the patient before they come and their families. What pieces of information that we are now going to be assessing and collecting can you guys help us with? So one of the questions we always asked was, have you fallen uh, prior to the hospital? Well, we made a clarification on our pre-admission assessment to include, have you fallen in the last 100 days? So they're helping us gather the information even before the patients come to the facility. So it's important to share um, with all your team members and find out where they might be able to help you out. Again, begin training early. That's, you know, as soon as you can when you get back, if you haven't started, would be great. Um, identify how you're gonna use the data and make sure people know how we're gonna be using the information. It's much more meaningful and purposeful for me if I know what it's being used for. If I'm just collecting information and I don't know what's happening to it, it's hard for me to engage in that. So I think it's important that you share with them how we're gonna be using the information. Um, you wanna practice, you wanna give people the opportunity to practice coding um, so that they feel very comfortable when you have to begin transmitting the data on October 1st. One of the other things that we've done um, is included something called an action plan. It's in your packets here, and for those folks who are live streaming, as Mark had mentioned, it is available um, on the training site and can be downloaded there. And I think this is one of the greatest things ever. I've sort of stolen this, and we use it all the time now. And it gives you the opportunity at the end of each of the speakers to kind of look at what was presented and sort of do a self-assessment of where are you guys at with this portion of the, of the measure? What pieces of information do you still need to cover when you go back to your facility? Who might be able to help you with that? And develop a real uh, action moving forward. Rather than coming to the conference, learning it yourself, sometimes we go back to the office, you get sort of tied up in stuff. This will give you a really road map to what you want to do next. And I think it'll be really helpful if at the end of each of the speakers that you utilize that. The example, you have one in your packets and it kind of just goes through how to use it. And personally, I think it's great um, and I would encourage you to use it. Thank you everybody. That's the end of my little introduction and I look forward to um, presenting later to you guys. And again, if there's any questions, you know, I'm a provider. I'm one of you, so if I can be of any help, and I certainly would encourage you to talk amongst yourselves. Um, we all have great ideas. You know, the Earth community is such a great one as far as sharing things. You know, if you have a great idea, tell the folks at your table. If you're struggling with something, 
talk with folks in the room because maybe they've figured out something that can really make your life easier when you head back to the office. So thank you, and I look forward to talking to you later. <laughs>